And last takeaway, important takeaway, uh, uh, successful pacts have nothing to do with prior secularism, pri prior Islamism, Islamic tradition or culture, but rather the institutional conditions in which Islamists and secularists engage one another as relative equals. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alawi. Thank you for introducing your book, uh, sharing with us uh, your uh, opinion, your works. Um, it was very clear, uh, valuable, and I think we agree on the fact that it remains a very complex uh, subject. Um, I think that we can open an exchange uh, so we can ask uh, your question. Um, vous pouvez, je pense, uh, poser vos questions en français. Uh, if you agree. Of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have a question, you can put your hand up, please. François or anglais. Ce que vous voulez. Ce que vous voulez. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. And uh, thank you for your intervention. It is still an honor to have you here. Uh, we've been talking about uh, secularists and... Uh, they often advocate for secularism in the name of democracy. Uh, I, my question is, in your opinion, do you think that we can imagine a true democratical state without any Islamic references in the Constitution or the references to Sharia law with a society that's 99.9% Muslim and that in one way or another has you know, like true uh, attachments to these rules? Uh, thank you. This, this book, by the way, and I hope some, some of you will read it in the context of your, first of all, of your interest and then also of your, of your work uh, for your formal academic work or beyond. Uh, it proceeds as a, true, as a proof. If a bit like a mathematical proof. If A is true and B is true, then we can uh, deduce C, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I say uh, the following in the book, and I've, I've, I've tried to convey that idea, although it doesn't come, uh, it doesn't come uh, across very strong, to uh, place as a, uh, uh, as a ceiling or as a criteria the advent of democratization with, the, with doing away of religion, I think is very realistic, and it doesn't work. Uh, that means that you are gonna exclude half of the population of the globe from uh, the criteria or from uh, the right to be considered a democracy simply because they view, they have a different religious experience. So the, the short question to your, to the short answer to your question is no. However, there must be, uh, uh, there must be uh, an agreement between all. And that is a little bit what I explain also in the book and I refer to uh, uh, Stefan's, Alfred Stefan's uh, twin toleration. Has anyone heard of this? article he wrote, The Twin Toleration. And that is a very important political uh, science article and I will urge you, all of you to read it. It essentially holds the following thesis. If political actors, religious actors, agree that, religious, that religion uh, can be practiced only but with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the idea that they will not impose it to everyone else, then, and they will give autonomy to the political sphere, and if, on the other hand, pol politicians or the secularists accept the existence <coughs> of religions and do not want to do away with it, then we can agree on how much politics and how much religion and faith remains in the public sphere and how much of it uh, essentially is or retires to the, um, to the uh, uh, individual and private sphere. And in fact, this is the whole difference between laïcité and, secular and secularization. Laïcité is a French term that essentially uh, expels religion from all manifestations in the public sphere and keeps it strictly in the private. Most other countries in Europe are secular and there is a place of religion in uh, the public sphere. If you see uh, King Charles, King Charles is a, is, is a, is a, is a very, is a, is a parliamentarian king and is a, operates or reigns within the context of a parliamentary parliamentary system. His first speech has talked about him being the defender of the faith and of the, of the Anglican Church, but he's also said, you know, the place of the church, I will defend all faiths, 
and the right of all faiths to be explored. So there's all obviously it's an elaborate process of negotiation, but it, it can only be done within the context of a clear understanding that neither can do away with the other. Then, where does uh, secularization uh, uh, go? That's another, uh, that's another issue. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Si, si vous permettez, je, je vais poser la question en français. Alors, avant toute chose, merci pour, pour votre présentation. Et je, je voudrais re revenir sur le cas de, de la Tunisie, notamment sur, sur le tournant euh, eyesight. Et donc, de, deux questions euh, s'imposent. La première, est-ce que, est que le tournant de la Tunisie aujourd'hui va signifier l'arrêt de mort, on va dire, du mouvement Nahda Oui. La, la contestation, oui. la contestation euh, populaire de, de ce mouvement en juillet l'année dernière. Et deuxième question, euh, comme vous le savez, il y a les élections législatives en décembre et l'opposition, la majeure partie de l'opposition a décidé de boycotter ces élections. Et moi, la question que je me pose, était-ce la bonne position, c'est-à-dire de, de, de sortir du jeu institutionnel pour lutter contre Kaysaït Ne serait-il pas meilleur d'investir la, la scène politique pour pouvoir continuer à pouvoir critiquer ce, cette personne. Je vous remercie. Euh, D'abord, ce n'est pas de Nahda dont il faut s'inquiéter. Est-ce euh, que Nahda va, euh, va se trouver éliminé ou pas C'est de, de la démocratie tunisienne dont il faut, il faut s'inquiéter. C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'elle va pouvoir survivre euh, l'expérience le, l'expérience euh, Kais ou pas. Alors, pour ce, pour ce, euh, pour ce, pour ce volet de la question, euh, je, pense, je pense à la chose suivante. Euh, il, y a, il y a un problème euh, euh, dans la littérature des sciences politiques et chez les, les, les observateurs de manière générale. On voit l'absence de démocratie comme automatiquement voulant dire... Euh, système autoritaire. Donc, il y a un, toutes sortes de critères qui sont appliqués à l'étude de la Tunisie, et ça ne mène pas des journalistes ou pas euh, des, des activistes, et on voit essentiellement que la Tunisie ne remplit plus toutes ces cases, indépendance de la justice, société civile, euh, euh, presse libre, etc., et on dit automatiquement euh, système autoritaire, donc euh, nous sommes dans une, dans une régression. Oui, nous sommes dans une régression. Mais l'absence la, 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 de démocratie ne veut pas automatiquement dire autoritarisme. Et ça, c'est une nuance très importante. Tant qu'il y a l'échafaudage de la démocratie en Tunisie, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a l'infrastructure euh, et qu'on puisse euh, justement appeler au boycott d'élections, ça veut dire que les possibilités pour, pour regagner du terrain et les sens pour réinstaurer la démocratie sont possibles. Et c'est le même exemple partout. Euh, euh, je, vous, je, vous, je vous encourage ici à réfléchir de manière transrégionale et trans, transversale. Euh, Bolsonaro au, au Brésil, c'est un peu un, 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 un caïs en Tunisie. Et ailleurs, partout, on a vu système autoritaire. Eh ben, il a perdu les élections. Non seulement il a perdu les élections, il n'a pas reconnu les élections pendant longtemps. Ce qui veut dire quoi Ce qui veut dire, moi, pour un observateur euh, de politique, ça veut dire qu'il était en train euh, d'encourager l'armée à intervenir. L'armée n'a pas intervenu. Et c'est ce que je veux dire par l'échafaudage. Tant qu'il y a un échafaudage, les structures sont là, et les structures peuvent reprendre le dessus. Et la L'exemple, la, 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 la Tunisie a des attributs très, très encourageants. C'est dans le sens il y a une mobilisation, il y a des gens qui comprennent les véritables enjeux, le rejet des, 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 jeux, euh, des jeux élitistes et des jeux un peu incestueux euh, politiquement entre les élites tunisiennes ayant été euh, refutés euh, avec, justement, l'avènement et avec le vote pour, euh, pour ce nouveau président... Maintenant, c'est déjà dans le passé. On sait d'ores et déjà qu'il faut se mobiliser pour contrer ce nouveau président et pour empêcher que les choses ne se détériorent davantage. Ensuite, vous avez un avantage très, très, très important en Tunisie. C'est l'absence de l'armée dans le jeu politique. 
pour des raisons historiques et aussi pour des raisons euh, institutionnelles, l'armée euh, a finalement gagné de la démocratie. Elle a été reconnue alors qu'à l'époque, elle a été totalement euh, marginalisée et minorée. Et donc, c'est pour moi la raison de croire que une, elle en sortira, la démocratie tunisienne en sortira gagnante. Mais pour revenir au thème de notre discussion d'aujourd'hui, le cas d'avant, étant donné qu'on qu va renouer ou que l'on devrait théoriquement renouveler avec une, électo, avec une démocratie électorale, c'est-à-dire non consolidée, mais ayant requis les minimums euh, de, de, de critères, je ne pense plus que les pactes je ne pense plus que les pactes vont être, euh, vont être inopérants aujourd'hui puisque l'essentiel de ce travail a été déjà fait. Donc on va, on va aller directement à la construction, mais une construction qui est non pactisée. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I have uh, a question, um, I guess, sup I suppose, regarding the political cleavage that you established between um, Islam and secular. Uh, when we discuss, I suppose, the post-colonial period. When um, I what? Sorry. Excuse sorry? me? Could you repeat just the last word? Yes. Um, like, when we discuss the, the post-colonial period, it seems that though Islam was present in both the rhetoric of Ben Yusuf and Bourguiba in Tunisia, it was largely instrumentalized. And so I'm wondering what has happened in this historical moment where we're able to establish a binary cleavage between Islam and secular in Tunisia when it wasn't so in the 50s and 60s, in the moment of independence. Well, that's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting point. Islamism in Tunisia is, uh, first of all, just about the, the historical dimension. Uh, it, it, it is the, we forget this, but the advent of the post-colonial state in our region is the advent of the uh, post-colonial, is, is advent of the modern state that basically monopolizes the discourse on religion. And uh, uh, it can either throw Islamists in jail through repression, or it can contrary, uh, give itself the right and the only right to be able to, de to deliberate and to adjudicate on these matters of the religion. So the first Islamist organization in all this era, in all this sphere, is the post-colonial state. So that's something we have to remember. And why that cleavage, it, it exists in Tunisia, but it doesn't operate in the same way, because Islamism in Tunisia is relatively a newcomer, a latecomer. Islamism in Tunisia doesn't emerge until uh, the early 70s through the movement of the MTI, which is basically the precursor or the predecessor to the al al Ghannushi. And that's for a simple reason too, is because um, uh, Bourguiba basically tried to secularize or modernize uh, the state without, uh, in the beginning it was, it was very, a little bit opportunistic on the part of Bourguiba. There's the Bourguiba before uh, during the, the, the struggle for independence that basically encouraged women not to take, to keep the scarf and, and, and people not to take French nationality. And then there is the Bourguiba who later on faces Ben Yusuf uh, and, and, and faces a candidate or a challenger which wants to see Tunisia anchored to the east and then endorses a kind of modernizing effort on the part of the state that is egalitarian to a certain degree. It is certainly hegemonic. It is certainly uh, coercive, but it is, uh, um, it is more uh, egalitarian than elsewhere. And hence, everybody felt that they are part of this, uh, this, this enterprise, which is, uh, which is very um, uh, justice-oriented and, 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 and that changed compared to other places. So that's the reason why uh, you know, is Islam comes to the surface in a very different way. And in fact, when I had asked Ghanoushi, he said, he said to me, we, were, we are Islamists because we believe this is part of our identity, but we are also very conscious of our uh, Tunisian wealth and our Tunisian uh, uh, repertoire, which is part of a national memory. I am, I, I, I am attached to the fact that Tunisia is the, uh, has elaborated a, 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 the 1861 constitution and the all Tunisians, I think it's part of our national repertoire. And I accept and wholly endorse the Mudawana of, uh, of, uh, of Bourguiba. So 
because of that more egalitarian uh, uh, policy, uh, politique of, of, of Bourguiba, the Islamist movement was more in, in included within the construction of the modern state and operating within the, the Jacobin state and tried uh, to, uh, to be part of it. And when he retreated on these, I asked him, I said, well, but why would you abandon the raison d'etre? He said, because I, for me, the ummah is not uh, between, uh, strictly between faithful and non-faithful. For me, the ummah is, a, is also a question of, uh, of preserving life, of preserving the maqasid of Islam, and here, uh, uh, Tunisianness is the criteria of part of that ummah. So we have all these sorts of dimensions, the legacies of the past authoritarian state, the, the, the trajectory of the Islamist uh, regime, and also the new, uh, the, 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 the sense of politi common political culture, which is uh, represented by a national repertoire and not just uh, a collective social system of beliefs. Yeah, my question pertains to your um, part on color revolutions, um, where you sort of go over the causes of color revolutions. And I was just wondering whether you think that um, foreign attempts at regime change, um, especially Western attempts at regime change, um, have a role to play in color revolutions. Because even during the Arab Spring, there was this constant rhetoric that um, people are only rising against the regimes because the West is supporting them. So um, do you think there's like a balance between the two narratives? Or what do you think, um, respectfully? Well, no, I think, uh, you, are you a political science student? Or uh, just so I know your background, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, uh, to, uh, to recommend uh, a piece called um, Color Revolution, which is seminal, essentially. It explains this, and it's, it's uh, I think, number 85 in world politics. Uh, and that's a very important publication if you read that. It's very, no. Colored revolutions happen, happen for a variety of reasons. First of all, before you have a colored revolution, you have I've, 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 I've advanced a little generically and I've little summarized a little of these arguments, which in a different setting would have required more elaboration and more explanation. Regimes in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, Eastern Europe, before knowing colored revolution, they've essentially made a stop. They made a stop and occupied as a stopping pause uh, competitive authoritarianism. What is competitive authoritarianism? Competitive authoritarianism is when an aut autocracy is partly free. It does not exist. Uh, partly democratic does not exist. Either you're democratic or you're not. But an authoritarian regime can be partly free and it can occupy uh, different uh, grades of that shade uh, of uh, that autocratic shade in the spectrum. So first, the, 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 the demise of these uh, uh, single party systems have given in some certain instances uh, political systems dominated by a single, uh, by, a, by, the, uh, by a dominant party that has been constituted uh, from the remnants of the old regime, remnants of the old Communist Party. And they have been political entrepreneurs that have known how to maintain power. But they have done so through the instauration of competitive authoritarian regimes. And comparative authoritarian regimes can be very stable if they know, if they know how to subvert and deflect threats. But at, but at some point, uh, they become essentially uh, you know, assaulted by all sorts of forces, and they essentially, uh, they essentially lose. So, ignoring that whole dimension, you know, which is the story of the Ukraine with the Kushma regime, and it's a story also. It's not so much a story of Poland, but it's a story also of of Romania. Uh, then you begin to understand uh, colored revolution, and you see that it these are 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 political and social dynamics which can be very well explained, and they have nothing to do with plots from the West or George Soros. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, coming here tonight. 
Um, I would like to elaborate more on this uh, notion of pactism. You've cited three examples, uh, Spain, uh, Chile, I would maybe include, I think you cited as well Portugal. Uh, but do you think that pactism is, is a necessity for uh, regimes that are transitioning? Because I think if uh, the cultural framework, if society is ready, if there's an internal push, if internationally the regime is also failing, uh, I think democracy does not need to uh, have this process of pactism to arrive in a country. And uh, I would also like to ask you about whether pactism is good for the- Wh Whether pactism what? Pactism is good for this emerging democracy. Because for example, in the case of Chile, in the case mm. of Spain, you have many cases of people that uh, tortured individuals that uh, were uh, very close to the regime that have never been tried, have never been judged, and still play a role, uh, of course, uh, not nominally, but officially in the uh, democratic process of the state if you want, in the institutions of the state. So you think that pactism is really a positive thing, that countries should uh, adopt pactism when uh, transitioning from a, an autocratic regime to a democracy? Well, let's be very clear on, on one thing. There is, an, uh, there is the original sin in pactism. What uh, Guillermo O'Donnell and what Philip Schmidler would have called in their book, the original sin. And the, or the original sin here is that we, not, we must always keep it in mind, is that uh, uh, this, is democracy through undemocratic means, is that the first inaugural step in uh, this democracy process is something undemocratic. It's essentially uh, getting together in closed doors and agreeing on certain principles. But then the contrary to that, or the counterfactual to that, how do you, how do you, how do you vanquish those three criteria I've been talking about, which are uh, extreme polarization, and which are normative diversity, and which are parity? When those all examples here basically Conflict is untractable. You have to uh, get over, uh, get over the, that, that obstacle, get over that hump, and it's an enormous hump. But I'll agree with you. I agree with you that pacted democracy has that problem, and as a result of that problem, it sometimes risks being a, a, an elite affair in which people are frozen out of a discussion and stay out of a discussion and, uh, 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 and are not uh, uh, included into uh, the debate. However, uh, Spain has been a pacted democracy and has uh, succeeded, uh, has succeeded, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, it couldn't have done otherwise. I mean, in, in the context of 1975, well, if you can, if you can offer me another, another uh, mode of transition, I would love it. Then the other mode of transition is revolution. Of course, you're gonna have revolution. Revolutions work, but it takes 25 years of an authoritarian regime that kills everybody, and that confiscates democracy, and that basically uh, uh, exerts tremendous economic burden on, uh, on people. And it's a case of the Islamic revolution uh, in Iran, the French revolution, je sais pas combien d'années de terreur. You know, and who knows? Some regimes can fall, uh, you know, and at the end of the day require revolutions to correct, but it's a question of path of minimum uh, of optimal cost. Now, there is an important issue also and that, that, is, that needs to be uh, clarified, and that is uh, pacted transitions do not necessarily equate uh, uh, a, a lack of a, uh, a, a lack of catharticism a lack of, uh, can I say, accountability as far as the crimes of the past. That is only the case of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Brazil and, uh, and Spain. But other pacted transitions have known instances of truth and reconciliation uh, committees and efforts that have led basically to, uh, to knowing everything that has happened in the past. And, and I think we talked about Latin America and we talked about uh, South Africa, and South Africa is one of those instances, and it was been led by Desmond Tutu. So do not conflate the two. Now, finally, finally and very importantly, uh, you know, this question of, 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 of a pact sheltering past actors and to a degree permitting them to somehow stay uh, in the shadows to come back and to reimpose themselves in politics 
uh, is an interesting, very interesting question. And I wonder to what degree the fact that the Brazilian uh, society has not known the extent of the past abuses of the regime, and some of the actors have, have uh, persisted and have survived that whole cataclysm, I wonder to what degree uh, they uh, have managed to emerge in the process of uh, a Bolsonaro. I wonder whether Bolsonaro would have essentially existed without sheltering and without protecting uh, those old enclaves. That's an open question for me, and I'm not, I'm not still perfectly resolved on that. Hi, my name is Karina. Uh, thank you so much for coming all the way down here. I, I don't think it's a very convenient location for anyone to be coming to. Um, I just have uh, three brief questions. Um, first of all, uh, you mentioned over here uh, institutional conditions, and uh, it seems to be part of a broad trend in current academic literature, which in what? a broad trend in academic literature, especially developmental literature, that attributes you know, the de uh, development of economies to institutions. And you know, I was wondering when you say that it has nothing to do with culture or with uh, a sort of traditional history, can we really separate institutional conditions from this? Um, in fact, uh, ought we isolate them in this manner? Uh, my second question would be that you seem to imply that pacting is, should be seen as a healthy feature and not a bug of democratization. Um, and that we ought to be ecstatic, in fact, when we see successful instances of pacting, for example, in Tunisia. Uh, then would you go as far as to say that a sort of competitive consortialism is the destiny of these countries? For example, we're going to see an, an entrenched multi-partyism in regimes like uh, Tunisia. And finally, um, would you consider Tunisia to be an exception? For example, I, I, last year I think I read a book called Tunisia, the Arab Anomaly. Would you say that there is such a thing as even a Tunisian model or we ought to aspire for a Tunisian model? Um, and if so, and if not, um, would you say that there is something transferable to other Arab states? Thank okay, uh, yeah, that's a long list of questions, but <laughs> remember when I talked about the criteria, I said about the criteria, and I was very, very clear on this, and I believe on this same slide. Let me go to it. Here they are. These are, thank you. No, uh, 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 voilà. Alors, uh, I said these are background conditions. The ba these are criteria for pacting. They are not. They do not determine the, the 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 success or the failure, the chances of success or failure of an of of a transition. They are only they are only the conditions which induce to pacting. And paradoxically. The more powerful you can have a situation where you have very high marks on all of these, so the so the the inducement for pacting is very high. But at the same time, you can have background conditions which are very disfavorable and still have a transition that fails. So I just want you to understand that it's a very it's a, I, I, it's it's a tricky nuance there, a distinction between what initiates a pacting process and what makes a transition succeed. Now, as far as developmentalism, yes, I agree. Uh, Adam Przewski uh, wrote very, very eloquently and very persuasively on this uh, business of, uh, of, uh, of development. The more uh, beyond a certain threshold, and he's tabulated that marvelously, statistically, beyond the very threshold, you see that a return to authoritarian rule is very, uh, is very unlikely, but then again, it's, uh, it's it, nothing is cast in stone. This is not an exact science. This is just correlation and the stuff you know with Gini, uh, Gini parameters, Gini variables and regressions and what and coefficients and so forth. So you can run these regressions and know. Pacting is not healthy. I do not say, I do not wish to imply that it's healthy. It's very unhealthy, uh, uh, frankly, because it means uh, democracy through undemocratic mean, but sometimes it's the only thing. Well, what do we do in the context of a of an uprising 
if the conditions are there for packing, we, 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 we let, the, let the transition go on until someone wins. What does that mean that someone wins? It can mean civil war. It can mean, in our region, the Algerian spectrum. Uh, if Ghanoushi did not pact with uh, uh, his secularist uh, counterpart, it wouldn't have meant the armies would step in, but it would have certainly meant that the Ministry of Interior and, this, and the police would have stepped in. I have no question, no doubts about it. And more importantly than me, he didn't have any doubts about it, or the people that entered into the pact, whether him or the secur security services know. Now, finally, this whole business about culture, and you're absolutely right. When I studied culture, I was your age or may maybe a bit older and my graduates were, culture, is, it, it, it's important, you know, where a country comes from, what are the forces, what, are the, wh what, what, what distinguishes it from other, the anthropology uh, the is, very, is very extremely important. The problem with culture is that it, it becomes a kind of black box in which you throw everything in. Culture, oh, that is culture, this is culture. And that is very disturbing for me because I, 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 it's a whole, it's a, it's a magma of, uh, uh, of, of, of material that I cannot discern. But what I felt helpful in all these countries is that Tunisians didn't talk to me about culture. They talked to me about repertoire. They said to me, this is a repertoire dans la mémoire collective. When Ranouchi told me 1861 is something important for us and the Mudawana is something important for us. And it brings, it brings the whole idea of, a uh, whole idea, and I think uh, I quote the book you talked to me about uh, the, the Tunisian exceptionalism. No, I don't, believe, I, don't think in, I don't believe in exceptionalism anywhere in this region. I believe in advantages. There is a Tunisian advantage in the same way there can be, in certain instances, a monarchical advantage. I believe in that term. There, 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 there are structures and there, there's a whole pattern that can induce uh, certain, certain, certain processes to go further more, more easily than others, but there's no such thing as an exception. At the end of the day, uh, this is about agency. It can mean, it means, it's more about, it can be about path dependency about certain structural variables, but it also means about ag agency, how people uh, can, uh, can bargain and deal with. After all, uh, the, the Tunisian Islamists were more brutalized by the Ben Ali regime than the Egyptian, than the Muslim fundamentalists were brutalized by uh, uh, the Mubarak regime or by uh, any regime in Egypt. Yet the Muslim Brotherhood uh, Played it, played the game of uh, we'll do it alone, while the Tunisians, uh, on the contrary, uh, 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 you know, uh, gave their hand and <coughs> and leaned forward to 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 embrace their other uh, colleagues and uh, and challengers. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, both of them are about Qais uh, Saeed. I'm not sure if they've already been asked in French or not, uh, but I'll uh, state them. So when we look at Tunisia today and its new constitution, which mentions Islam and the Islamic Ummah, do you think it's a process of compromise uh, with al Nahda, or rather a reflection of the independent president? And my second question is, there's often this popular notion, usually perpetrated by outside actors, that Qais Saeed is taking Tunisia backwards by breaking certain elements in democracies through decrees and you know other measures. Um, he still remains very popular with the people, especially when he's ruling in these decrees and you know the measures that he's taking. So in essence, um, is this, uh, well, is Qais Saeed's action, are they taking Tunisia a step backwards or forward? Uh, he's not taking Tunisia forward, not at all, okay? Uh, confiscating spaces of freedom and of democratic governance is not taking the country forward. It is essentially confiscating those in the name of a dubious political, uh, 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 that uh, of its a dubious political project that has shown its limits and essentially shown its true nature in other parts of the world. It is populism, and we've seen it before. You know, you, you can call it Caesarism, call it whatever you call it. It's essentially uh, uh, 
charismatic ruler. Uh, in this case, I fail to see the charisma, frankly, uh, but it's a charismatic uh, uh, ruler that, uh, you know, uh, incites, uh, you know, the fears of people, the anger and the resentment of people, basically, to centralize power in the name of a project, in the name of a complicity between leadership and the people, and essentially replicates an authoritarian re regime, which only, uh, uh, which only uh, uh, creates more problems. And the and the the, the 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 result is clear. The result is clear. Just look at the the latest FMI, uh, IMF, uh, you know, package and the IMF negotiations with Tunisia. It's anything but a blank check. It's anything. Uh, 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 but a uh, but an endorsement of his governance and the confidence the international community or the business community or the economics uh, economic power holders in the world give his style of government. But again, in these things, as, as I was saying earlier, you never take a country backwards. You don't take it forward. But you, there's never a return to the past. It's always you know going either right to the right hand or to the left. It's going someplace, but certainly not. Uh, it's certainly not the past. A lot of this populism, you know, in the world, and this is important to say, maybe it's the moment to say it here, in the entire Arab world, the only country that could have become populist is Tunisia, paradoxically, or interestingly. Why? Because, first of all, you needed an electoral democracy to usher in populism. No other regime in the area can be populist. No other regime in the area can tell the people uh, we're gonna, you and I are gonna partner together against uh, the corrupt politicians and the corrupt elites, whether in business circles and business elites or political elites, for the same, for the same, for the, for the simple reason that these regimes have been governing for so long that they can't turn around and disavow themselves. So, just in that sense, it's not, it's, it's a proof that Tunisia has moved forward in showing a, an anomaly or a pathology, an auto autocratic pathology that is much different than one other is. So it's, it, in a bizarre way, uh, a, a forward-moving uh, movement, uh, and at the same time, I doubt that uh, he can perpetuate, uh, uh, perpetuate his, his rule indefinitely, yeah, but it's a, it will run its cycle, and at some point there will be mobilization, there will be enough sectors of the Tunisian society that uh, coalesce, uh, against him and wanting to restore or return to the democratic process. But as you're right, you need a critical mass and maybe that critical mass is not there. Should I go? Yeah, hello and thank you for your uh, talk. It was very insightful. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, this concept of pactism, if we apply it in the Islamic world and in those Arab countries, don't you think that it is uh, limited by the fact that there is a more like a, a sort of propensity to to between the Islamists and the more progressive parts of this pact to go further towards more pr liberal and uh, progressive uh, reforms in the long term? I mean, uh, for example, let's take uh, the example of, of uh, abortion of, or of LGBTQ rights. Uh, in those countries, since the actual uh, situation is that there is, no, uh, there is not a recognition of those rights, in the long term, the only possible uh, result of this pactism would be um, an ending with the recognition of uh <coughs> of those uh, actual rights. I don't know if you, if you understood uh, my point. I understood you for perfectly, and it's extremely well taken. And it's okay, thank you. You're absolutely right. This is an entry point for an electoral democracy. It is not consolidated democracy. So it's not, when we talk about an electoral democracy, then I'll have to put you into the indexes. That means that still you do not have elements of liberal democracy which have taken roots. It's only electoral in the sense that there are rotations of power and the rule of law is accepted, but still it's not enough. So this is an entry point. And let me just show you the last slide, which I never intended to show you, but again, since you're also intelligent at Sciences Po, <laughs> you've taken me to this. To this. Now, I discovered after writing this book 
I've discovered that at the end of the day, there's another takeaway. Remember my takeaway before? I did, I did this. I showed you my takeaway and my last takeaway was that. Well, there's another takeaway which precisely uh, links up to your question. And that is about theological production. Meaning, after all this is finished, like in the case of Tunisia, and let's not forget this, certain Tunisian laws have been enacted in which certain families can ensure that same inheritance rights are between uh, female and, uh, and, and, and male offspring. That is an enormous theological change. There are, uh, 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 there's an article in the Constitution, I believe, about uh, freedom, la liberté de conscience. That is unthinkable. That goes towards, and uh, 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 that towards towards precisely a liberal democracy. Now, after the the conclusion, I wanted to tell you the other takeaway is that at the end of the day, after all this change and after uh, imposing on the rank and file of the Islamist sectors. Uh, 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 in society, or rather the political parties in society, then you have, you have to be congruent, which means you have to go back to your theology and produce theological concepts that are in tune with the position that you've taken during the, the, the Muslim, during the, the pacting process. And here's an example. Tunisia's in Nahda justified separating its spiritual wing from its political party uh, with doctrinal revision. Tahassu, specialization for sake of advancing akhlaq morals. In other words, the party has separated from its da'wah uh, wing. It's not only part of the party. That is an enormous, uh, uh, that is an enormous theological, uh, 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 theological, how can I say, artifice uh, theologique, which goes in the sense, goes in the direction you've taken. Instead of governing through la contrainte, through constraint, you govern through hidayah. It's still using Islamic terms, but it's still a, a movement forward towards uh, uh, the, the secular, the secular, uh, uh, the secular society uh, you, you, you wish for. Now, what I want to underline in this is that pacting is the entry point to exit authoritarian rule. Then there is the whole concept of finding an equilibria, finding a, a contract, finding a mode of coexistence between faith and uh, secularism. And that depends, of course, on the history of every country. And it depends also on how political life is conducted. Now, many of these Islamists, as your colleague said, will not return back to business. We don't know. Will the PJD return back to to business in Morocco if there is a political transition will it be? No, but there are enough conservative sectors within society that want faith to play a role in public life. That at the end of the day, someone has to occupy that pole and someone has to represent that pole and someone has to uh, uh, enact or has to give a mandate to that pole in politics. And that's, uh, uh, talking about the future of Islamism in the region that I don't know, but religion will always have a place in the future of this, uh, of this region in the, in, in, in the future. Now, uh, I can very well, or someone else can very well say, well, you know, you, 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 you want rights uh, for this or that group, but that doesn't conform with my own vision of society, then what do we do? I, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm for people choosing their whole life and living their lives as they want. But that represents me. It doesn't, like you, it, you know, we represent each other, we represent ourselves. But at the end of the day, the interaction between these two forces is gonna, hap is gonna happen once we exit the, uh, uh, the, the, the autocracy and we, we, we lay down the foundations of an institutional framework that can work for our parts of society and then we can deliberate. Uh, you know, Ireland was there before where abortion was, was impossible to envision. Ireland, uh, Poland was there. I mean, this is 20 years, 20 years back. So it is, not, uh, 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 it is not science fiction. It is a trajectory. It is a, uh, it is a, 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 a march forward that 
Tunisians, Moroccans, Algerians, and I will have to deliberate and we'll have to work together uh, to get there. Well, you guys mm -hmm. are really sharp huh, for undergraduates. Alors, je revoilà. Donc, vous revoilà. <rire> non, non. Euh, Comme Renouji. <rire> <comme exact. rire> Quand on le croit partir, il revient oui, toujours. Oui, exactement. Oui. Donc, si, euh, si, si vous me permettez, je, je voudrais euh, élargir le, le spectre comparatif que vous avez euh, Bien sûr. Euh, débuté dans le cadre de la comparaison des Bien démocraties sûr. pactisées. Oui. Et je voudrais... Euh, quand on étudie l'index de démocratie oui. dans le monde arabe, oui. précisément au Maghreb, on se rend compte que la Tunisie recule oui. et qu'il y a un tournant autoritaire qui est en train d'être pris et que la Tunisie se rapprocherait du, du niveau de démocratie que le Maroc a aujourd'hui. Oui. Et donc, pouvons-nous considérer que, euh, alors que durant ces dix dernières années, la Tunisie oui. a été considérée comme le fer de lance de la oui. démocratie, oui. est-ce que cette place n'est pas aujourd'hui prise par le Maroc qui lui entame petit à petit une, une démocratisation en, en suivant des, des, des réformes, contrairement voilà. à la Tunisie qui, elle, recule. Est-ce que vous me posez une question poliment sur le Maroc ou est-ce que vous posez une question sur la Tunisie Sur les deux, sur la, non, la, non. le comparatif si vous, entre les deux. Si vous voulez me poser, vous vous donnez un conseil. Vous êtes jeune, c'est très intelligent, c'est très bien fait. Mais si vous voulez poser une question, la jugulaire, elle est là. Bon. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez du Maroc Est-ce qu'il a dépassé la Tunisie Est-ce qu'il recule est -ce qu a... Je n'ai pas vu les indicateurs de euh, la Tunisie et sur quels critères reculera-t-elle ou sur quels critères euh, le Maroc avance ça c est, c est, ce sont des données hautement techniques généralement il faut faire attention aux cases qui tout simplement disent euh, non démocratique donc autoritaire donc j'ai essayé de le dire maintenant si vous posez votre question euh, pour le Maroc le Maroc est, reste un pays qui est dans un contexte d'une monarchie euh, traditionnelle elle est sur le papier et concernant beaucoup d'analyses juridico-légales, une monarchie absolue. Cela ne veut pas dire que c'est un système politique fermé. Non, il est ouvert. Il est plus ouvert. Maintenant, pour comparer les deux techniquement, vous me demandez une question technocratique. Ça veut dire combien de, de manifestations on empêche au Maroc, combien de manifestations on empêche en Tunisie, et, et tirer un trait euh, euh, entre les deux. Euh, Est-ce que le système marocain avance vers une, 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 une démocratisation. Sûrement, s'il aboutit vers une démocratisation, euh, euh, ça sera sûrement à un moment donné ou une autre à cause d'un élément de rupture. Moi, je ne peux pas vous dire quel va être ce, cet élément de rupture, dans quel contexte va-t-il se constituer, est-ce que ça va être économique, est-ce que ça va être social, est-ce que ça... Je ne peux pas vous dire. Euh, euh, ce que je peux vous dire aussi, c'est que il est très difficile de comparer les deux, euh, sinon on risque de tomber dans des choses technocratiques. Est-ce qu'il faudrait voir combien de journaux ont été interdits en Tunisie Est-ce que des journalistes ont été mis en prison Et de l'autre côté, voir euh, la même chose pour avoir une... Euh, rattraper la Tunisie, c'est encore euh, avoir euh, un préjugé de dire euh, voilà la trajectoire de chacun, où se trouve l'un, où se trouve l'autre. Tout ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que la Tunisie est un pays qui a connu une transition, qui connaît une régression, mais qui est une régression dans les espaces. Euh, le président essaye de le refermer, mais il ne peut pas les confisquer. Il y a une masse critique, il ne pourra pas le faire. D'autant plus que je ne vois pas de, 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 de manne géopolitique. Je ne vois pas euh, de vecteurs géopolitiques qui viennent l'aider contrairement à l'Égypte. Je peux me tromper. Ça peut rentrer en, en, en ligne après, mais je peux me tromper. Euh, le Maroc, quant à lui, euh, a connu une libéralisation euh, plus ou moins accrue. Euh, elle a connu des soubresauts, elle connaît des moments de recul et d'avance, comme le pendule. Et euh, malheureusement, force de constater qu'il y a un moment aujourd'hui où l'État est plus intolérant à l'égard de la liberté d'expression et à l'égard de, euh, de certaines choses et, et à... Euh, semble avoir euh, donné la priorité au développement économique. Donc, il faut bien comparer et réfléchir de manière transrégionale, mais il faut faire attention de ne pas tomber dans des définitions technocratiques. Non, le, 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 on ne recule jamais dans ce genre de choses. On ne revient pas en avant. On ne revient pas en arrière. On peut se perdre à gauche, on peut se perdre à droite, mais on ne recule pas. Le train de l'histoire avance. On peut... Euh, 
suspendre, geler un petit peu les progrès. Euh, mais euh, au final, les vraies questions se posent. Et les vraies questions en Tunisie sont les suivantes. Monsieur le Président n'a pas les moyens de sa politique. Il ne peut pas tout simplement scotcher la bouche de tous les Tunisiens et il ne peut pas aussi euh, empêcher que le pays n'aille à l'abîme économique. Il n'y a pas que moi qui le dis, c'est le, le, le FMI, la Banque mondiale, c'est tous les bailleurs de fonds qui le disent. Madame oh, je... Non, 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 une seconde, s'il vous plaît. Vous, si vous, 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 vous... Oui. J'étais sans trop à être en Provence. Euh... Il y a beaucoup d'intérêt dans ce que vous avez dit. Euh, et moi, pourquoi vous avez laissé Oui. Attends. Attends, je la vois pas, non Non, tu peux continuer, on n'entendra pas pour l'instant. Euh, voilà, je me demandais si volontairement vous avez mis de côté la Turquie. Le la Turquie Ah, la Turquie, la Turquie. D'abord, c'était formellement le monde arabe, c'est pas MENA, et donc la Turquie ne fait, ne fait pas partie. Ensuite, c'est deux pays que j'ai que je connais plus ou moins, que j'avais pouvoir, euh, 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 pouvoir euh, connaître. En fait, mais voilà pourquoi. Et puis, je voulais, je voulais, je voulais bien une étude en, en ricochet, une, une fine grain, un, un espèce de, de face à face. Et euh, concernant la Turquie, et la Turquie connaît, euh, connaît aussi un, un moment de populisme dans... dans dans la, la politique d'Erdogan, euh, il a essentiellement utilisé le playbook qu'utilise tous ces euh, tous ces populistes, avec beaucoup de brio d'ailleurs. C'est pas prendre euh, ça. Ça, c'est un argumentaire pour une démocratisation pactée. C'est pas nécessairement un plaidoyer. C'est it's not aspirational. C'est c'est pas aspirationnel. C'est 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 plus technique. Et donc Erdogan se retrouve comme un populiste classique, et lui, il va un peu plus loin que les autres populistes, euh, et plutôt se retrouve dans la catégorie de Poutine, où il dit, c'est pas seulement le, le problème, c'est les élites corrompues, c'est les élites corrompues, dans ce cas-là, c'est pas seulement les oligarques du kémalisme, comme dirait Poutine, les oligarques de Yeltsin, mais c'est aussi la grandeur euh, de l'Empire ottoman. C'est la grandeur et notre place de l'histoire. Et l'histoire, c'est l'islam qui fait partie. C'est regarder à l'est, regarder à l'ouest, et puis ne se, pas se faire marcher sur les pieds. Et c'est un peu ce que Poutine fait euh, regardant vers le, vers le tsarisme. Mais tout joue un peu dans le, dans le répertoire, euh, dans le répertoire populiste, populiste avec, euh, avec euh, brio. Le problème de, ces, de tous ces partis, de tous ces systèmes autoritaires, et c'est que après dix ans au pouvoir, euh, vous devenez un monarque et pas seulement un président. Et quand vous êtes un monarque, euh, vous vous entourez de courtisans et de laquais. Et finalement, vous voulez que tout le monde autour de vous soit une caisse de résonance de ce que vous voulez entendre. Et vous n'avez jamais les bons rapports et jamais va vous, personne ne va vous contredire parce qu'on vous dit seulement ce que vous voulez entendre. Et c'est le piège classique dans lequel est tombé euh, Poutine, c'est un peu le piège dans lequel va tomber Erdogan, et c'est le piège dans lequel va tomber euh, le président chinois qui s'est intronisé aujourd'hui en empereur, et nous verrons certainement pas la croissance de la Chine, mais on verra ça comme un moment brégenévien. Et, et donc plus euh, l'auréole du passé est pesante, plus cette dérive est, est, plus, est, est, est plus dangereuse qu'ailleurs. D'ailleurs, Kais peut être autiste, euh, au pire. Euh, Erdogan peut être euh, à ce moment-là totalement, euh, totalement insensible, justement à cause de ce phénomène autoritaire, ce phénomène de devenir euh, monarque. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. <rire> merci beaucoup. Okay, so I'm going to make it short and efficient. Um, now that this conference is coming to an end, I would like first and foremost to thank uh, Moulay Hisham Alawi for accepting to come here today. Thank you so much. 
Um, just like the book, this conference offered us an interesting analysis of how a democratic pact could work in the MENA region, despite the religious factor that is often perceived as something that prevents um, the democratization of the region. Indeed, as we saw in Crisis at Sciences Po, the question of how democracy might emerge in the Middle East and the Muslim world in general as a whole is puzzling, is a puzzling question. And when studying this topic, one can clearly notice the complexity and uh, the nuance of it. Thank you again, Mulehisha Malawi, for coming. It was a pleasure and an honor to welcome you with us on campus today. Um, thank you for the participants and everyone in this amphitheater for attending this conference. I am sure that we all learned valuable insights from it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. You've been a, a wonderful audience and you've pushed me hard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci.